Good afternoon, and thank you for joining us for this Farm Bill Conversation. My name is Devin Cornia. I'm the Executive Director of NOFA New Jersey. And today I'm joined by Stephanie Harris, longtime board member for NOFA New Jersey, and Congresswoman Shelley Pingree. Congresswoman Pingree, thank you so much for taking time to speak with us. To uh, our- it's such a pleasure. Thank you for having me. Just to give our audience a little bit of background, you've had quite a distinguished career full of public service, wearing many hats, including that of a farmer, small business owner, president of a major nonprofit organization, state senator, the first Mafka apprentice, might I add, Mm -hmm. and you're now serving as the U.S. representative for Maine's first congressional district. I'd love to hear more about your journey from the farm to the hill. Sure. Well, again, I'm sorry I can't be with all of you today. I'm sure it's a wonderful gathering and there's nothing better than being in a room full of people who care about organic farming, gardening, and food. So um, hopefully I can come again some other time, but it's a it's a great treat to be with you on the Zoom screen. And um, I feel very fortunate to have had a chance to work on the issues that I've worked on. My history and interest in organic farming goes all the way back to the 1970s. I I'm actually originally from Minnesota. My grandparents were Norwegian immigrants, but I um, ended up in Maine as a back to the lander in the early 1970s. So I spent two years living you know, off the grid, back to the land, reading Helen and Scott Nearing's book, Living uh, Simply, <laughs> Living the Good Life. So um, I was very interested in the sort of early sustainable movement, Earth Day, uh, all of those things. Um, I ended up being a student at College of the Atlantic in Bar Harbor, Maine, and uh, my first teacher was Elliot Coleman. So I feel like I've learned from the best and got early early education in organic farming and gardening. Um, and I went on to uh, have my own farm, my own small farm. My first farm in the 70s was uh, 100 chickens, three dairy cows, and uh, a handful of pigs, and I sold vegetables in the summer. So um, a lot of the same things that people are doing today, I've been a sheep farmer, I've had a wool business, um, uh, and my most recent endeavor has been in the really agro kind of hospitality business with a small farm, farm to table, um, summer restaurant, uh, an inn and in, in another restaurant. So I've sort of um, had a good opportunity to experience everything from you know small farms to tourism to food processing um, along the way. And the best thing is that somewhere in the middle of all that, I got involved in public policy. I'm from a very small community. I live on one of the islands off the coast of Maine. So we have about 400 year-round residents and maybe two or 3,000 um, in the summer. Many of them come from New Jersey. So thank you for sending us your visitors. Um, and I really got involved in local politics. We have a town meeting form of government and um, cared deeply about what was going on in my community. I actually ran for tax assessor first because it was the one job in town town that nobody wanted. So um, I thought I could win, but uh, I went on to serve on the school board and then eventually managed to end up running for the main state legislature. So I served there in the 90s and was the Senate majority leader, but also on the agriculture committee. And um, fast forward in 2008, I got elected to Congress. So I've been here now for 14 years. And the one part of the story that I'll tell um, I really, when I came to Congress, I'd done a lot of work on single payer health care and the cost of prescription drugs. And I thought I would really focus on health care related issues or small business issues. Um, And I thought that working on agriculture policy would be somewhat unreachable. Don't ask me why, but I just kind of imagined that that was a, a difficult place to go to work. And it turned out that the agriculture committee was mostly people who represented one kind of a commodity or other. You were there to, you know, represent cotton or corn or soybeans and and sort of fight for your commodity and the subsidies. And there weren't a lot of people when I first came who were really interested in organic farming or sort of our food system, um, the importance of food as as medicine, and just all of the things that we care so deeply about today. So um, I've been on the committee off and on since I first got here. I also serve on the Appropriations Committee. I'm the subcommittee ranking member on interior and the environment. So I get to work on climate change, uh, agricultural appropriations. And now a lot of my focus is really on the importance of climate change in agriculture, which in my mind, um, you might as well just write down the term organic farming, because really that is sort of the ultimate climate friendly kind of agriculture and all we can do to support that um, all the better. So um, that's a 
long history of how I got to here, but I, I still live on an island. I still uh, grow my own vegetables and um, and help out with the farm whenever I can. Well, thank you so much for joining us, Congresswoman, and especially a, a deep, uh, heartfelt thanks for being such a staunch supporter of small uh, organic farmers and farms, uh, certainly in an industry in which Earl Butts famously <laughs> said, get big or get out. And um, you have brought up the issue of climate change. And I wanted to address uh, the uh, proposal that you made in 2021 with the Agricultural uh, Resilience Act. And I was hoping that you could tell us something about some of the proposals in that act and uh, what happened to that bill and whether or not some of these proposals might end up in the farm bill. Sure. Yeah, thanks for asking. Um, well, the, the way it works, um, as you know, uh, you mentioned, we're, we're writing the next farm bill. So every five years in Congress, we write a five-year farm bill. The last one was 2018, so 2023. We're at that time again. And the way it works with a bill like the Agricultural Resilience Act, which um, I'm reintroducing, so I've written it once and then look for co-sponsors and continue to do it, is really just as you said, it's a it's a bill to provide uh, an opportunity to have all the legal language and the things that you're interested in in kind of one place. And it's rare in Congress, particularly in today's Congress, um, to move through a massive piece of legislation all your own exactly the way you want it. But once you have that legislation, you can take it apart into pieces. You can make um, little sections of it an individual bill. You can move them into the appropriations bill, which is our annual funding bill. Um, you can have, uh, you know, co-sponsors sponsors on some sections of it. People are interested in one part, but not another. So not to get too much into the nitty gritty, but it's a, it's a very, it's a live and important bill. And some sections of it have already been included in some of the legislation we've passed. Um, and some of it has already been taken on by the, um, by the USDA. Some of it we will continue to try to move. But just to give you a broad sense of it, I wanted to put together the things that I thought um, most impacted agriculture and climate change. As we know, industrial agriculture and many of our agricultural practices account for about 10% of the carbon in our atmosphere. So agriculture is often thought of as the bad guys. And certainly uh, there's a lot in industrial and, and commercial agriculture that we desperately need to change. On the other hand, we know as organic farmers um, that uh, farmers can be incredible partners in the process of um, uh, reducing the amount of carbon in the atmosphere, and in particular, um, sequestering carbon in the soil. So the main focus of my bill is really around soil health and how do we increase the amount of uh, carbon in the soil. Um, again, I'm, I'm preaching to the choir here, so I don't have to explain composting to anyone or cover crops or um, less tilling, um, less upsetting of the soil. So those kinds of techniques, um, making them um, stronger parts of our conservation programs, making sure that farmers are rewarded for the carbon that they sequester in the soil, particularly recognizing that many of our organic farmers have already done great work. So if there's, a, a, in a sense, if there's a reward in there, you don't want it just to be about um, how much did you increase it from terrible soil to good soil. It's uh, people who have sometimes been doing this for 50 years and maintaining that soil health. But we know that there's a, an amazing ability of organic matter to draw down the roots to store that carbon. And I think um, for all of you, that's a, that's a given. But I think a lot of times people on the outside and, you know, who are environmentally focused but aren't um, aren't sort of keyed into organic principles think, well, what we need to do to change uh, climate change is to plant some more trees and not eat any more meat. And the fact is, we can't plant trees on all this farmland. Trees are incredibly important. Maine's a very forested state, but people don't have much of an understanding of how much you sequester in permanent pasture, um, in the root systems, in, in um, compost itself. So um, that's a long-winded way of saying there's a lot in there about soil health and composting and those kinds of practices. There's a lot about pasture-based livestock, because I'm a firm believer that a closed loop system with pasture-based livestock is truly, um, is truly environmental and climate change friendly. Um, there's some in there about more research. We need a lot more research as we go into the future about varieties. We need to preserve those varieties that are fast being lost, whether it's animal or seed varieties. 
um, a section on farm protection and viability. I'm a big believer that we got to save all the farmland that we possibly can. Um, every time we convert a farm, again, people in New Jersey or Maine know this very well, when you lose a farm and you convert it into um, development or pavement, you've not only lost that ability to sequester the carbon in the soil, but you've added that many more cars on the road or pavement or whatever it is. And I have a lot of in there in there about viability, because one of the ways we keep our farms preserved is to make sure they stay viable, um, whether it's um, promoting more local foods, marketing, value-added producers grant, many of the conservation programs that exist and, and more. Also a section on unfarm renewable energy, anything we can do to make sure our, our farmers have access to uh, biodigesters, solar panels, windmills, whatever it is that works to reduce on-farm energy costs um, is all good. And then food waste itself. We waste about 30% of the food in this country. So we got to do everything we can to reduce the amount of on-farm food waste. But as we know, much of it happens at the retail level, in our restaurants, and in our landfills. And um, and uh, food waste has become an increasingly large contributor to the methane in the atmosphere. So everything we can do to make sure that we either turn that um, into compost, um, well, first make sure the food goes to people who really need it. Um, and then if not, it's it's used in a, in a viable way. So as you can see, I tried to have a very comprehensive look at this in each one of these little sections, um, you know, goes into a different part of the farm bill or a different part of the appropriations bill, or some of them are standalone bills and happy to talk any more about that. Or people can also go to our website and see, uh, you know, a more comprehensive overview of what's in there. And we're always open to suggestions. And Ms. Pingree, uh, if we could shift gears only slightly, you mentioned farm viability and farm viability and food security are two very big topics and buzzwords right now. And I think central to food security is farm viability because without the farms, we don't have a secure food system. But a few of the things that actually really work on a ground level for food security are some of these farm bill programs like the Gus Schumacher Nutrition Incentive Program or the Farmers Market Promotion Program. Are there other programs or opportunities within the farm bill or without the farm bill that you think should be given more support? But when it comes to farm viability overall, um, I always think it's important that everybody who has a, a small farm of any size, I know it's not fun to have to write the grant proposals, but that everybody's fully aware of um, the opportunities that are out there that you can learn more about at the NRCS or FSA. Um, and again, we're, we're happy to supply more information, but programs like Equip that allow um, you to have more money for hoop houses or cover crops, composting facilities, SARE for the research grants that you can do right on your own farm, value-added producer grants are particularly helpful if you're on a farm and you want to um, add value to the product to help it make it more profitable. So all of those we consider incredibly important. Um, when you speak about the nutrition side, uh, one of the things that a lot of people don't understand is about 75% of the farm bill is devoted to nutrition when it comes to the actual value of it. And unfortunately, um, that is where most of the political fights happen. Um, we have more bipartisan agreement on things like conservation programs and and a variety of things that are in the farm bill around rural, rural development and, and other things. But um, that has sadly become a partisan fight often over the years and um, is the place where I have seen farm bills be delayed um, a year or more. Uh, it, it, it is unfathomable to me why we would have to fight about whether or not people should have food. It's just one of those things, you know, if we're going to say, well, you can't have a new car this year. Okay, I get it. But food should be just generally available. And then second, as you mentioned, the GusNet program, um, ability for people to buy fresh, healthy food, uh, because it's one thing to just fill people up with calories, but we all know um, increasingly our diet has become, uh, you know, challenging and we have a lot more unhealthy food outcomes. So we have, um, we have money in GusNip that is a farm bill program. We don't have enough and we need to have more. I've heard from people at farmers markets that there's not often enough um, availability of the of the match. It basically says if you use your SNAP benefits um, to buy fresh fruits and vegetables, you can double that amount, which is great. It just doubles your purchasing power. power. So um, I'd like to see us increase that. And I'm, I'm very 
anxious to find any program that we can to make fresh food and vegetables healthy and available. I also think buying locally, um, you know, we just know that uh, it's better not to transport your food for sometimes, you know, up to a week in a, in a, in a big truck, take it all the way across the country. And people are increasingly interested in buying more food locally, looking the farmer in the eye. And, and so all the programs that we um, can support that, that help with that, um, do more of that, make it more available. And, and as we all learned during the pandemic, um, it, these supply chains are easily broken and they weren't very good in the first place, this sort of notion of transporting food all over the world. So um, I, I think the timing is right to continue to do more to strengthen our supply chains, make more food available locally, make it possible to grow more food year round, even in cold regions in, in my farm in Maine. We grow in hoop houses in the winter and increasingly um, farmers are doing that with cold weather crops. And, and I think we should encourage all of that that we can. Um, you mentioned uh, bipartisan support, which leads me to the question, now that we have a new Congress, uh, what do you think the support will be like for big changes in the farm bill that you are mentioning right now? And have you worked on some areas where you have found bipartisan support? You know, agriculture um, has a lot more bipartisan opportunities than some of the volatile topics that we work on in Congress. Um, and I've found some real change over the last decade. Um, I found a huge uh, growing, a huge uh I've, I've found a lot of increased interest in organic farming generally. I think um, in, in farms all over the country, farmers have realized that there are market opportunities there as this is, you know, grown by the tens of billions every year. Um, and so I found a lot of my colleagues are more supportive of organic farming that used to be sort of this, you know, hippie Birkenstock back to the land kind of uh, movement. Now it's, you know, 50, 60 billion dollars a year. And that means for the farmers who are able to sell into that market, it's often much better value for your product. So um, we've been able to increase organic transition funds um, uh, and support more of our uh, organic farmers and just kind of recognize the viability of it. We also just recently had an announcement from the FBA about strengthening um, the rules and regulations, because that's a, obviously a big concern, making sure that it's a brand that you can always trust and that, um, you know, we don't uh, we don't allow fraud or sort of uh, fake names of natural and healthy and all the other things people want to use. It, it doesn't mean anything. Um, I think in the conservation programs, we've seen a lot more interest over the years. And while there tends to be somewhat of a partisan bias against saying the word climate change. Um, there is a fair amount of interest in what those programs represent. Increasingly, farmers themselves are so impacted by adverse weather that even bigger farmers out in the Midwest and in places where it didn't used to be so widely supportive are saying, yeah, I think I should do more with cover crops, increase the organic matter in my soil, less tillage, um, because it helps uh, increase the yield and increase my resistance to drought or excess water or just the the horrendous problems that are happening in these extreme weather events. So I've found much more agreeability. The challenge with the farm bill, I'm, I guess the beauty and the challenge is it's 12 different titles, including nutrition and rural development and all these things that have to come together. Um, it became, uh, it's sort of an urban, rural, you know, um, compromise. And um, and bringing together that level of support can be tricky. On the other hand, when you've got such tight margins as we do in the House between Republicans and Democrats, it sort of forces a little more compromise. The Senate, um, Debbie Stabenow is the Democratic chair in the Senate. She's worked on other farm bills. She's from Michigan. She's, she was um, the strong supporter of programs like Gus Nip. So we know she's on our side on virtually every issue in the farm bill. And the Republicans in the House um, will have to figure out ways to work with the Democrats in the House as well to kind of bring it all together. But it's not always partisan. I don't I don't um, you know, I, I and I don't even want to say like, you know, there are Democrats who agree with me and Democrats who disagree with me when it comes to certain things. But generally, as I said before, the big fight tends to be about the rules and regulations around nutrition programs, SNAP benefits, who who gets to access them. 
And during the pandemic, we greatly increased the opportunities for accessing SNAP benefits. Um, and we shouldn't take a lot of that away right now. You mentioned the booming growth of the organic industry as a whole. There are some criticisms of the integrity of the organic label. So I'm curious how you see we can continue to increase the integrity of the organic label and if there's any way for Congress to provide more oversight to the National Organic Program. Yeah, I mean, the USDA just announced last week that they're going to go into a final rule on um, what they call strengthening organic enforcement. Um, and having been a certified organic farmer much of my life, I know how rigorous those standards are, and I know how important it is to have rigorous standards. Um, this will um, tighten up those rules around um, importing food, which has been a place where a lot of food has been um fraudulent food has been imported or food has been fumigated on the way in. There's a whole variety of things. It will require that the people who handle food um, are certified and just require a lot more oversight. So I think it tackles a really important part of the fraud and, um, uh, and, and general oversight, also increasing the number of people who are available to do that work of looking for fraudulent um, uh, claims. I think, um, and, and, and I have a lot of good friends who, um, are, are strident organic farmers, but don't like the USDA, don't like certified organic, call themselves real organic, call themselves a whole variety of other terms. And as far as I'm concerned, um, nothing is better than someone who wants to be even better than organic or, you know, even more strident. Um, and I don't think, I don't think this, it's a perfect government system. And I fully understand the problems people have experienced with a, with an organic program, the natural NLP. Um, I don't know that I can resolve all of the issues that people have in the farm bill. A lot of it is related to um, organic hyd hydroponics and how people stand on that. And um, I've I've always been someone who believed that organic should, the organic certification should involve soil. So that's, that's sort of where I stand, but it doesn't mean, uh, you know, I've always won on this argument. Um, so I, I understand. And I don't think, um, I don't think that we should throw up our hands and say like, well, that didn't work so much for organics because there are people who think um, it could be stronger. Um, I, I think we should continue to strive for, you know, better, stronger goals um, and, and never let, um, never let that sort of be a reason to say like, let's dismantle, let, let's face it. It is the most um, reputable, dependable brand that we have right now. It's the one that is thoroughly certified by the USDA. And I think we're going to enter an era where people are going to want a lot of other labels. They're going to want to say like, well, this is um, climate friendly growth practices. There's, you know, people talk about regenerative all the time. And I'm thrilled that there are conventional farmers who are looking at regenerative practices because they're finally realizing that, um, you know, that they owe a lot to the soil that they work with every day. And it is the, it is their future. But just because they call a conventional farm regenerative doesn't mean they've got practices as good as a certified organic farmer, you know, in New Jersey or Kansas or anywhere else. So it's it, there's a lot to be debated there, but um, we have to hang on tight to making sure we keep this as strong as possible because the temptation to add new names and new brands um, is, is going to get, I think, only greater over time. Um, Michael Pollan has noted that we reward the wrong things. And I was wondering if um, the farm bill could help small farmers to become more profitable and not just continue to subsidize the large agribusiness that we have now. I would say for many of us, it's always our number one goal is how do you shift the farm bill to make sure that um, that we don't spend so much subsidizing commodities, that we don't spend so much subsidizing corn and soybeans and animal products, um, and that we do more on small farms, small to medium-sized farms. I've seen some shifting over the years that I've been here. More programs are tailored to small. Some of the ones that I mentioned, and there are others. 
um, that are now available. There's now um, whole farm crop insurance. It used to be you could only insure your acres and acres of corn. You can now um, have a small farm um, with all of your crops insured. It's still not a perfect program, but it gives, particularly in these um, times of you know, drought or uh, dangerous weather systems, it gives farmers a lot more opportunities. The value-added producer grant, the local food promotion programs, all of those things are directed towards what can we do to make a small farm more viable? And um, I am always open to more ideas or, you know, more potential um, programs. One of the biggest issues that we have is some of the good programs that people like to use run out of money way too soon. So sitting on the Agriculture Appropriations Committee, my number one goal is always to sh get more money in there. And um, we did some of that in the Inflation Reduction Act. We added a fair amount of money um, in a one-shot um, endeavor in the in the conservation programs because they're some of the places that we can access the most. Um, in the long run, uh, getting, you know, getting better prices for farmers um, and, uh, you know, allowing them better opportunities to compete has generally happened in states like yours or states like mine when farmers access a, a retail market, you know, selling off the farm, selling at a farmer's market. Um, all of those things, I think, can be can be really helpful. But overall, you um, it's it's still a very fair criticism of the farm bill to say that you know just kind of as you said going back to Earl Butts you know we've had a we've had a emphasis in our country going in the wrong direction for more than fifty years about get bigger get out support consolidation you know all of those things and um, I think we've you know we've been pushing back very hard but um, you have to kind of keep in mind that the the lobby behind the food and agriculture industry um, in our country is larger than the lobby behind the defense industry. So this isn't something that, um, you know, you're, 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 you're pushing a big rock up the hill all the time. And, and, and we really have made a lot of progress. The other, you know, true kind of secret weapon is that consumers themselves um, have said, you know, I don't, I don't want to buy from big agribusiness. I don't want to buy from farms that I think aren't treating animals well, or that don't treat the land well. And uh, we can't underestimate the incredible power of that and have to use it to our advantage all the time. Well, I love how that came out of your mouth. The power is in the people forever. <laughs> um, I wish we could talk to you for hours, but we know you're plenty busy and you've got plenty of important work to do. So as we close out, are there any last remarks you'd like to share with our community? Well, just um, first, thanks for having me today. Um, if, you know, we'll make sure that all of our, my contact information is available. If you have questions or suggestions or things you want to um, see us work on in the next Farm Bill, I'm anxious to hear. We have a lot on our website about the um, agricultural related bills we've worked on. And if there's more information that you need there, happy to work with all of you. But um you know, the fact that even though I'm not with you, I'm, you know, I'm in front of a room full of so many people who care deeply about our agricultural system and the supply chain and making sure that hungry people get food and that we get healthy food to all the people in our country. Um, you know, that is what fixes things in Congress. And um, we are often behind um, what what people think and what trends are and what people want. And I know that all of you are, you know, are doing a great job of pushing your state legislators and your members of Congress in the right direction. And we we couldn't do it without your help. And this is a really important year. It's going to be an important farm bill. Um, climate change is moving faster than we ever um well, then everybody else used to think it was going to happen, and now we know it is, and we have to act very quickly. So we could we could use all of your hard work and, and power right now. Well, we know you're not with us today, but we know you're with us in the fight for good food and local food systems and, and for increased farmer support. So thank you for all the hard work you do. Thank you so much for taking the time to join us today, and maybe you can join us next year at uh, the 34th Annual Winter Conference. I will look forward to it. Thank you so much for having me. It's been a pleasure. Thank you.